Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. I'm here with Paul Raffleson of Raffleson Law and Paul is an expert, in fact the expert in e-commerce law. So we're going to talk about all things to do with law and e-commerce. So first question, Paul, what, what points of law do e-commerce sellers need to take most, pay most attention to and what do people kind of fall down on? Okay, so uh, great question. I do have to preface this by saying the word expert is kind of like a no-no in the legal world, but I do know a lot about it. Like, <laughs> let's just say I know a lot about e-commerce and law. Let's just say I've, done, a, I've done it for a number advice. of years. It's my it's what I specialize in. It's my focus, but uh, they don't like the word expert. Uh, so I just want to be, uh, but to answer your question, what is e-commerce law? E-commerce law is an interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting concept that it sort of, um, I sort of came up with it when so a little background about me 20 years ago or no how, i don't know whatever 2003 and four was however many years ago that was from here uh i used to sell on, on amazon i used to sell on half.com and and all these platforms i was a reseller um i was doing what they call retail arbitrage they didn't call it retail arbitrage back then um so i've been in this game for a long time my wife has actually worked for seller performance on amazon so i used to hang out with the seller performance team so i was not and because i was a seller i was naturally interested in the conversations that they would have over dinner so I've been around this e-commerce world for a long time, even though um, I've, I've never been a seller like my clients, like at that scale. But, um, you know, I was a seller early on in life. And what I ended up doing in my life after kind of leaving leaving my you know business of selling to kind of help support law school and, and all those things, is I went to work for really big companies, companies like Microsoft, Walmart, GE. So companies that focused on national commerce and international commerce. And what drew me to e-commerce is this idea that we are supporting something called the international small business. This is a concept that never existed, could not have existed, but for e-commerce, right? There was no such thing. Nobody say I'm running an international small business out of my kitchen table in the 1980s, right? That just could not happen. Um, it did happen with the, with the event of e-commerce. So what I think e-commerce law is, I think it's a hodgepodge of having to know just the right amount of certain bodies of law that are really important and having a national and international minded focus, right? So, so it's a very different scenario to help you. If you want to open a tea shop online to sell tea around the world, right? That's very different than opening up a tea shop in the middle of town, even though the tea shop in the middle of town may actually require more work, more permitting, right? What you have to look out for is very different. So you have to be aware of a couple of things. You got to be aware of intellectual property law. You got to be aware of corporate and business law. You got to be aware of, of uh, consumer protection law. Um, you've got to be aware of environmental law, right? All these things kind of come together on Amazon. So, so being an e-commerce lawyer, in my opinion, is sort of having a national and international minded focus and being sort of in tune just enough with certain bodies of law that are really important to e-commerce sellers. Doesn't mean you have to be the world's trademark expert. By no means is that required, right? Um, but you do need to know when you'll need that expert, right? Sometimes you got to call in uh, for reinforcements if you have a really complicated case. But um, what I think makes e-commerce law interesting, it's very scalable because it's very, it's very like we kind of know our clients better than they know themselves even before we've met them, right? Even though the products are different, even though it's like, but we've been, we've been through this before, right? We know just the amount of what they need in each area. So it, it's an, it's an interesting area of law that, that I think it's, still being developed uh, to this day. And I, I love the fact that we were kind of on the forefront of this. Okay, so let's talk about the kind of cross-border thing, because that's the kind of stuff that I come across. If I'm a UK seller selling into the USA, what kind of things do I need to take note of? Sure. So obviously, you're going to want, again, intellectual property is key. So you want to, whether you're in the UK or the US, but you want to make sure you have a US, you know, if you're a brand owner, you want to make sure you have a US trademark, right? You want to make sure that that's happening, right? Because having just a UK trademark isn't going to be enough. You want to consider what is your appropriate corporate setup. Like, do you need an LLC in the U.S.? Do you know, what are the pros and cons? Um, you want to make sure you have insurance set up. You want to make sure um, you have everything you need. You also want to make sure that you're complying with U.S. law. So that can be state law. That can be federal law. So, for example, there's if you go on Amazon and Google Prop 65 Amazon, there's a whole page dedicated to Prop 65, which is a California-specific environmental law. That can get you, you know, not following it can get you into a little bit of trouble sometimes. Um, so things like that are really important. So you kind of really need somebody to sort of be a navigator and help you figure out. And this is what we do with UK and, and foreign based sellers all the time who want to sell in the US. If the product you're selling is, uh, 
you know, a bicycle helmet, you want to make sure that you're complying with consumer product safety commission laws, CPSC laws. So if it's, uh, you know, a product that is regulated by FDA, maybe you're selling um, some type of water filter that goes into a Brita machine or something, right? Then you're going to, you may need some FDA uh, help there. It, it's those little things, those little nuances that get people because for, for the longest time, Amazon didn't really police this stuff. Now they are. So it's, it's, we're seeing what, what we're seeing is, especially with FDA compliance, like Food and Drug Administration, FDA, um, a lot of people have kind of gotten away with not following it for the longest time. Now it's like their 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 listings can be just down for months because of because Amazon's now kind of cracking down on that. And that some of that has to do with the shift of how Amazon sort of sees liability and who's responsible for when you know when things go wrong. So that, that's there's sort of a whole other story we'll probably get into later about that why that is. But that's that's sort of what we're seeing in a nutshell. Because I really noticed that I mean Amazon particularly has ramped up. It used to have it's now got its kind of account health thing, and there's all kinds of different policy compliance things which are very very hard to answer. And I've actually just spent the last two days trying to solve this uh, yeah. a, a, an Amazon suspension problem, which has been very boring. Um, what is your right as a seller if you get an account suspension? Um, what are your rights as a seller? Is there anything you can do from a kind of legal point of view? So what are your rights? I mean, you don't really have a lot of rights in that, you know, in the United States, at least, you know, you're limited to sort of certain arbitration, you know, Amazon has the right to sort of, you know, protect itself, right? So you're, you're kind of running up against that reality. So, you know, your rights aren't really clear. What we do know is that in our work and working with the antitrust subcommittee and sort of being advocates for sellers. So in my spare time, I run a nonprofit called the Online Merchants Guild, and we advocate what I've learned, though, is the way to sort of establish rights with Amazon, you know, especially if you're a U.S.-based seller, is to, you know, is to look at where Amazon is concerned. You know, Amazon's in a situation right now, we're in an environment where the government wants to break up Amazon, they want to regulate Amazon. So they're very concerned about members of Congress hearing horror stories, right? So if you're in a situation where, you know, you're unjustly shut down, right, and your business is, is, is at the verge of collapse, you know, one way that we can leverage is we can, you know, we can work with members of Congress and say, hey, look, you know, this is happening. And, and they may inquire on your behalf and they sometimes can get things done that others can't. So there's there's a and this is just sort of one example. There's many ways we can leverage the scenario and the environment that Amazon is in to try to sort of establish some rights. We did work on a law in California called I believe it was like SB 66 back in 2019, which tried to sort of establish the first Bill of Rights. But actually, and, and there, the idea was that Amazon had, it, it, what that actually led to was the 72 hour notice. If you, if you actually want to know where the 72 hour, hour notice came from, it came from our lobbying in, and what in is California. This, what back is this 72 hour notice? I haven't come across that. So it's the idea that they won't suspend your account without 72 hours of notice. Like well, they, they say you're on. Certainly, you're, certainly doesn't happen in the UK. Yeah, it's a US thing. It's a California thing, but it actually has became a US. I mean, when California does it, it effectively becomes a US thing. So that's the idea of that. Um, came from the United States. It came from there. But it's by no means like, it, it's actually funny. One of the things that we've been pushing through our advocacy group, Online Merchants Guild, is the idea of a federally written seller bill of rights in the United States that, you know, that, that Amazon will not take certain action against you without appropriate warning and opportunity to cure. And that the action will be reasonable and that they will handle it. You know, like, like we, we basically want to see a seller bill of rights come about. That's actually one of our goals that we're trying to push. But for now, you have to navigate the suspension web. And that's what we do. I mean, we have we have a team and we have ways. And we what we like to do is we like to work the process with Amazon. And when that when we feel that process is broken, it's not working, then we bring it up to Amazon's attention. And we'll go through various channels, whatever channels we can, we'll go through. If that includes members of Congress and who are who are interested in in seeing what Amazon's doing to the sellers, we'll do it and we'll show them the fact pattern and we'll get and and to get Amazon's attention so that somebody who with authority will actually look at this and say, "Huh, that's wrong. You know, that shouldn't be." Because I so, just but had, it, it's, it, as I say, I just had an experience where we had a problem. We weren't selling. We had a, a um, Singaporean account which we weren't even using. Um, we yeah. missed some policy warnings on it um, from this kind of historical listings. Um, and they shut down not only the Singapore account, but they shut down almost every other account we have as well. So it's all our European accounts and our Australian accounts and our, and our Japanese accounts, which was was seemed disproportionate. Well, I would look for those. I mean, I you know I don't know. I'm not a I'm not familiar with the British political system, but I would you know I would not. I would definitely tell you. I mean, 
certainly we'd love to help you. So certainly, you know, after this call, I'd love to get online, get you on my team and, and have them talk to you and see what we can do. But I mean, one of the things you can do is, you know, you know, first of all, we still write emails to Jeff and Amazon.com as the, you know, sort of, you know, second to last form of escalation before we go other routes. But talk to your MPs. You know, I don't know who who politically in UK is most critical of Amazon and the monopoly. Find those folks and talk to them and let them know and have them make inquiries on your behalf. Like have them because they can actually get right Amazon to respond. Right? Nice. They they have people on their committee that can say, "Hey, one of my you know one of my constituents reached out to me and this seems really stupid and it seems like your bot system is in a is in an infinite loop of nonsense." And my client, my my constituent wants to wants to like bang his head against the wall. Could you please have somebody smart uh, and with authority look at this case? And a lot of times, it works, right? I mean, I had I had a I mean, a mergers and acquisitions deal with an aggregator. It almost went totally foul when a client submitted a uh, sorry, a, somebody from China submitted like a bogus takedown using copyright uh, copyright act called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. No identifying, you know, identifying my client's own artwork that he drew as a co- as infringing on their copyright that they stole. You know, classic, classic, you know, move we see when China-based companies can act with impunity on the system. And what we did was we knew who his state senator was. We knew him very well. And we said, to the, you know, we sent an email to the state senator. So this happened. My clients have to lose a big deal. Um, you know, we don't have 14 days to wait for, re- you know, this is really bad. Uh, within 45 minutes, the senator contacts me and says, what is the seller's merchant token? Kind of like not sure what even what that means. But when a senator is asking for a merchant token, you know, they're talking to Amazon. Right. And then within an hour from that, I get an email from my client saying, bam, I'm back online. So, I mean, don't no. under don't, you know, right now, like the way what I try to preach is, you know, when I used to work for really big companies like Microsoft, G, like we lobbied, right? We and we work together. But what we realize is like these companies are not invulnerable. Like Amazon is genuinely afraid of regulation. They're afraid of EU regulation. They're afraid of US regulation. Hit them where it hurts, right? Go after the, find out where the weak points are and go there, right? It's a classic strategy to try to get answers to your questions. But what I would do first before you do that is make sure you're in the right. So I would work with, work with people who know this stuff, you know? So like I, like I said, I would invite you, you know, to please talk to my team. Have us take a look at the case. Make sure that everything's in your know, ducks in a row because I don't like to do that unless I know my clients in the right. Right? Like, like, like Amazon is completely wrong on this. I don't want to do that and then ha- find out. Well, duh, you messed. You know, you were missing up this, that, and the other because then you look, you lose it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So okay. I like to go to Amazon. I like to go when I go to those escalation tasks. I like to have clean hands. Right. That's the key. I want everything's got to be perfect. All, all. Even if you're wrong, it's okay as long as you write. As long as you write the wrong or, you know. You know, as long as the right can be wrong, you know what I mean? So those are really important. But I, I would encourage you to, you know, don't, you know, American sellers, same thing too. contact your congressperson, contact your senator. You know, those are always ways. But, you know, we help our clients do this all the time. Um, we really do. It's, it's, it's one of our many strategies that we use to push, um, you know, to push, uh, you know, we had one over the weekend where we had to do something like that. And, you know. It works. And we, we have a good dialogue with Amazon because, you know, they know that, you know, Congress listens to us, but we're, and we're not, you know, one of the things we don't, we don't charge, we don't charge our clients more money for these types of services. You know, this is all part of a, a flat rate plan. So it's like, whether we get it done with one appeal or whether we have to go all the way to the mat, like it's one, we don't charge an escalation fee. Like we don't do anything like that. We don't profit from the idea that we're very good at this because that's to me is dishonest and, and okay. improper. So it's, okay, it's, it's found, just got to be. I mean, my, my experience with Amazon is that you've got to, you've just got to, they engage with the process that they, they and just follow the process and you'll probably get out the other side. Cause. Absolutely. No, I mean, this is, yeah. I, I mean, again, what I'm talking about is when the process doesn't work, right? When, when yeah. we can say we follow the process, because the first thing we always do is we follow the process and then, when there's an ir- irretrievable breakdown of the process, that's where we go. Okay, well, what can we do for this person now? Okay, yeah. But we do have to show coming in with clean hands, as I'm sort of saying. In my opinion, part of that is saying we did try to work the process. Yeah, yeah. The process doesn't seem to work, right? We're reporting this as almost like a bug, right? Okay, cool. So I've got another question for you. Um, liability. So you've got a, you're a customer. You're buying from a, a wholesale or something. Thought it goes wrong. 
what is your general kind of you know is the liability is that is that with the the retailer or is that with the supplier what what would they be interesting question so the way it works in the united states is if somebody gets injured using a product that you sold even if you didn't make it right even if you're just a middleman like you're just reselling or arbitraging or if you did make it like everyone can be liable it's called strict liability so the seller the retailer can be liable that could be amazon right it could be you depending on who you ask right the court sort of see amazon now as the retailer so that's where the law is going so amazon is typically held liable and then um but so so basically it's a matter of who can you sue so so let's let's put the logic of this Let, let's take a step back imagine for example you know, you bought a product, the product was made by, by a seller uh, based in China. Um, you sue the seller in China. You can't sue the seller in China because they're in China. There's nothing you can do, right? So you're injured and you want to sue Amazon, but Amazon's like, hey, we're just the flea market. We didn't do anything. We're just, we're just, we're just providing like the real estate, the digital real estate for you to sell, right? And then you're kind of out of luck, right? Well, that was the case in, in um, Oberdorf. Um a Pennsylvania case. And that's kind of, it was the first case where the courts are like, wait a minute, Amazon's a little more than just kind of the real estate here. They're not just renting a mall, right? They're a stall at a mall digitally, right? They're really more involved in the transaction. They're kind of are the retailer. And so there's sort of an injustice element that the courts are looking at. And they're saying, you know what, Amazon, you're going to be responsible for this because to the extent there's going to be people in China who have no insurance, who are nowhere, you know, who can't be sued, right? Then and there's a lot of injustice for those who are injured. So Amazon will now, now what we're seeing in the last few years is Amazon is now always named in every lawsuit. It seems like they're almost always named in every lawsuit involving injury. So if you sell a product, somebody gets hurt, most likely you'll get sued. Amazon will get sued. Um, and that's pretty much the way it goes. So what happens when, 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 what happens when that happens, what happens to you? So Amazon will immediately say to you and they'll say, Hey, um, seller, uh, we just got sued in this lawsuit. We need to know that you're going to hold us harmless. You're going to indemnify us. So please, you know, respond notifying us that you know, you're going to hold us harmless ultimately you're going to have to do that but the way you do that is you don't just say yes you contact your insurance company you now now most recently in the last what year or so amazon started requiring that you name amazon as additional insured on your insurance policy so yeah, they should be named. That. that's just happened to me yeah so that's the key that you have that insurance policy for at least a million to me a million is not enough i think it should be more um but uh at least for the United States, because our, you know, we're in the United States, we are, our, you know, liability for lawsuits is very high. Um, but Amazon requires a million. They require them to be named as additional insurance. So basically you're going to contact your insurance company and you're going to pressure them to basically give Amazon, um, you know, you know, assurance that you're covered. And that's pretty much it. Um, and then from there, your insurance company should hopefully handle the lot, you know, provide you with a law firm and a lawyer to handle the case. And you shouldn't have to do much else from that. Okay. Um, but that it, it's, but the, the reality is that's, you know, back in the day before there was this requirement that Amazon, before you even had to have insurance, Amazon didn't check, like they required it, but they didn't check it. There was just a lot of people selling on Amazon. And what shifted was cases like the Oberdorf case where the court said, no, Amazon, you are actually liable. You are strictly liable. You're part of the strict liability chain. Um, that's what sort of changed. And that's where Amazon started going and saying, okay, we're actually going to we're actually going to police this insurance requirement now. So Amazon is actually policing you. So in some ways it's better because now everybody has insurance. So you should be covered. You'll have your, you know, your insurance company will provide you with a lawyer. Um, but it's it's that's the the nature. And and just so people understand how strict liability liability works. The idea is that I, as the injured party, have the right to sue anybody in the supply chain, right? From up, you know, from anywhere from top to bottom, right? From manufacturer to retailer, whomever I can recover from. So let's say, you know, you're unreachable, you sue Amazon, you win. Amazon still has the right to sue up the chain going to you or your supplier to recover their losses, saying that you're the ones who actually were at fault. Nice. It's just, it's just the idea. The idea of strict liability is that the consumer, the injured party, should not have to struggle with trying to find the appropriate party. Like everyone in the chain is liable, jointly and severally, as we say. So it doesn't matter who you go after; you're all liable. And then it's up to the supply chain to figure it out among themselves how to really redistribute so the. What I'm saying is, be properly insured. I think is that would that be the takeaway? Yes, and really, you know, consider 
um, consider more than a million, I would say. And and the other thing is also like look at your insurance policy and consider other policies such as um, errors and emissions, E and O policies. Ask about things like Prop sixty five in California, Proposition sixty five in California. It's environmental law. Ask about not having a website that's compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Ask them what coverage you need for something like that, because those are the things that are getting people too. This is not necessarily Amazon specific, but these things do happen when you're in a, typically a lot of Amazon sellers have a website. Amazon does have a Proposition 65 issue uh, uh, disclaimer on their website. You know, I would talk to your insurance broker about these types of issues and see if you can get additional insurance to cover those types of issues as well. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's called P&O, errors and emissions insurance, but talk to your broker about that, just getting those extra extra bits of coverage for for those kinds of things. If there's any, you know, incidental infringement insurance, that would be great too, you know, for accidental infringement, if it's possible. Um, but, and, and like I said, more than a million is probably better if it's not unreasonable to get, you know, two, three, four million. It, I, I would pay for it. You know, the bigger you are, the, the more I would pay for it for bigger insurance costs. Okay, so what about, um, I've got a question for you. I don't know if you do much stuff with eBay these days, but we I've had a, a, a various um, eBay Vero, Vero complaints, which is where someone has been accusing us of, of um, misusing their international intellectual property. And it seems to me that there's these companies that brands will hire a company to, to police this stuff on, on, on their behalf, and they will accuse the seller of doing something. And, you know, a lot of the time it, it seems that they are overzealous, but there's no way of, of it's, it's very difficult to get the thing removed. Have you got any advice about that? Yeah. Are you, now are you talking in the context of reselling? Or are you talking more in the context of, of just, you know, being very aggressive with with accusations. No, I'm more specifically because I'm a reseller. So, for example, you know, we would buy a product from a wholesaler, and the wholesaler would say, "Yeah, yeah, you can sell that wherever." We list it on eBay. Um, the company would, um, you know, the, the brand would would have some person um, policing their their um, brand, and they'd say, "Oh, this seller is selling this product. He's misusing our intellectual property." So, we have bought a product from a registered, you know, a, a legitimate wholesaler. But uh, this brand is 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 kind of illegitimately getting their products removed from eBay. So I'm going to have to go back and look at Vera. So this is so we have the same issue with Amazon, right? So we we have a ton. We've developed a real like cult like following in one of our programs called Seller Basics with our resellers because of our aggressive approach on people. So brands using you know so this sounds like this. Is, tell me this is what this is. But like let's say I'm selling. Um, Let's say I'm selling a North Face jacket or something, a fleece from North Face, and North Face will use you know brand registry tools maybe to 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 report infringement or counterfeit. Yeah, even though it's it, not a counterfeit, it's a it's a, even it's though you're like yeah, no, I bought it from I brought it directly from your website or I bought right, and they're saying it's because you're not an authorized dealer, right? So they're trying yes. to control distribution, map violation, well, number of reasons, right? And so they're saying that then they're trying to rely on a body of case law that sort of you know, a little bit gray that sort of takes what we have is the first sale doctrine in the United States. And this idea that, you know, you have the right to quality control and certain other elements that, you know, to basically say that if you're not following those guidelines, that could be infringement. So in Amazon land, there's a clear policy on Amazon that you cannot use Amazon's brand registry tools for the purposes of controlling distribution. In other words, Amazon says we respect the first sale doctrine, which is the U.S. law doctrine that says anything you own legally, you have the right to resell legally. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. Right. Same in the U.K. Right. Amazon. Right. So Amazon has this law, and it's very clear. Uh, so what we do with Amazon, and we do this uh, more often, is we say, you know, what we do is we go after when brands file these IP complaints against our clients, our members, or Seller Basics. It's a free service we provide. We go after the brand. We say, look, if you don't retract this thing right away, we're going to package this up to Amazon and let them know that you're abusing their brand registry system and get your brand registry rights taken away. And that's something we've done, right? Amazon has told us that the work we do, they will strip a brand of their brand registry rights. If they find out that they're using services like brand registry for purposes of enforcing distribution, you know, trying to control distribution, limiting, re limiting resellers, et cetera. With eBay, it's even crazier. So I don't know the Vero policy off the top of my head. I'd have to ask my team because we don't get a lot of Vero clients, mainly because, for one, it's not believable on Vero. Because let me tell you, when you buy on Amazon, one of the reasons why it's why it's murky is because people who shop on Amazon, they see Prime, they don't necessarily understand like they're not buying from Amazon. Like Amazon's done a very good job of like 
making the process so fluid that you don't even know, right? Like if you go, Alexa, buy me a pair of, of, of New Balance sneakers. You're not going to, Alexa doesn't even tell you who the seller is, right? Like, I mean, it's just like, it's just like most people don't really even know. They just see Prime and they click, yeah. right? So there's a real potential argument that there is some confusion to be had on Amazon about whether you're buying from Amazon or you're buying from a seller. But with eBay, and this is the right out of the Williams and Sonoma case, by the way, but with eBay, it, people know, right? People know eBay, you're just kind of like, you don't know who the hell you're buying for, primary language, right? So it find, I find it hard to believe that these brands actually can enforce, try to enforce distribution rights on eBay. Because it's like, that's, you know, I don't know what your expectation is when you buy from eBay, whether you're getting a factory warranty or what, but uh, it seems less believable. But my guess is if I were to go through Bureau Terms of Service, there's probably a clause that says they're not allowed to use Bureau for this reason. So what you need to be doing, and what I guess my team would be doing in that situation is similar to Amazon's telling the Bureau that this is bullshit, part of my language. I, I do curse. I am from New Jersey. I am flawed. <laughs> um, uh, but this is BS, eBay. These guys are not really infringed upon. They're just trying to control distribution. Um, the other thing I would do is I would, again, raise it to your politicians, right? Because the anti-competition laws in Europe and in, in the UK are so much stronger than the US in some ways that I would actually say, hey, these companies are trying to destroy my business uh, by lying and saying, you know, and interfering with my right to first sale. If you have a similar doctrine in the UK, I would certainly push that. But I would actually, you know, I'd love to look at the case and I'd love to go back and I have to reread the Bureau in terms of service, but I have to believe Bureau has clauses in there that's similar to Amazon. So Amazon, you can find it in the intellectual property policy. You can find it in the seller code of conduct. That all this stuff is that they are subscri- that they subscribe to the first sale doctrine and it's, a, and it's a violation of their policy to use a brand registry tool for such a purpose. I have to believe eBay has the same policy in the Bureau. And if not, uh, I may reach out to some friends of mine at eBay and ask them why it's, it's not. Gen- in my experience, it's generally something like they want to say, you know, you need to, they'll accuse you of, of using the assets without, you know, the photographs, et cetera, without, without um, permission. Well, okay, so so this is a tricky one, but like don't, like I, when you resell, like I always tell our clients, like when you set up a listing, now easier on eBay than Amazon because Amazon, you're under one common listing, right? You're under the ASIN system. With eBay, just make sure you're not using their photos, right? So you got to take your own pictures, right? And um, you know, don't use any of their don't don't use their don't copy and paste their language. Write your own stuff. Use your own photos of the product, and then that because if you do use their pictures and you do take their content, then they have an argument that there's some infringement yeah. going. Then yeah. then, then there's cop, counter copyright issues, right? Because those are the, they they have the right to use those photos. They did not give you a license to use those photos because you're not authorized. So I would say first things first is yeah, check. That's what I would want to check. I want to check and see what are they, what are what are you guys doing in terms of how you're listing the products to make sure we're not running afoul of any other things. Because that's that's a classic one. A lot of our clients make that mistake when they list on Amazon for the first time, they'll just take the photos, stock photos from the website of the company and like, don't do that, please. You know, okay. change it. So, okay, right, customer abuse. If you've got a customer that uh, buys something from you and they send you back, send you back a brick in the post, what can you do about that? Yeah, I mean, if it happens enough times, I mean, definitely, like I said, you know, complaint. Amazon has report abuse, uh, um, report abuse, uh, um, uh, 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 email handles, and, and I believe even links now in Seller Central. Um there are, you know, there are ways, like if it's a real problem, you know, sometimes it's just a rite of passage, like it happens once a blue moon, sometimes it's just better off just writing it off. But if, it, if it's happening enough, or it's affecting a business, um, you know, definitely escalate the issue, you know, send an email to Jeff. And again, talk to your members of Congress. If it's a problem, talk to us. Um, we'll help, you know, we'll help you. But I mean, there, there's, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, you know, I always look for things like, um, you know, I always say, check your voice of customer um check your vocs always monitor those and just see what people are saying when things are getting returned um you know my favorite are when like there's you sort of have these abusive returns and the people just write like you yeah, know this product made me sick and then you realize that you know the product was put back in inventory so how could it have made you sick if it was never open right like if it's a you know like if it's a you know an edible product or something like that so there's always just always monitor things but you know, there are ways to escalate this stuff, but I would definitely open a case and fight fight for that. You know, if it's affecting you, um, if it's happening a lot, open up a case and, and fight. And then, you know, if, if anything, I, I just say reach out to us. 
I don't know how to tell you what we do that's good. We just, we're good at what we do. I don't know what it is to tell you. Like, I mean, I don't mean to sound like, it, you know, the only thing is, is we're also very cheap. Like the other thing I, the, the thing about me is like my mission is to end the suspension business. Like I actually want it to die. Like I hate it. I, I fundamentally think it's, it's the biggest distraction and waste of time that we do, but it's such a necessary thing that we have to do. So like we become good at it because I want it to go away. Like I, it's like my mission to like, you know, the unnecessary suspension stuff that we deal with on a day-to-day basis can just like be such a time suck and we can all be doing better things. So we yeah. do it cheaply. We do it passionately. Um, all with the goal of like trying to help Amazon, like learn from their mistakes and not have these things happen. So if it's, if it's happening on, on a grand enough scale, um, you know, there are things we can do that just sort of, again, get it, try to get it in front of the right people, um, and, and get you some recourse for that. But certainly, you know, start by filing a claim with Amazon. Um, and I'm sure my team who does this on a day to day, like, you know, I got actually, actually a team of people who, you know, ex Amazon sellers and, 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 and whatnot, who, who just know the stuff full and better than I do, who probably have ways to handle it. But definitely don't take it lying down. You know, if it happens once, yeah, maybe. Okay. But I mean, if it's happening at a level where it's really affecting your ability to do business, let us know. It yeah. does seem to me with Amazon that there's almost like half the business is trying to get you to succeed and the other half is trying to get you to fail. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I think Amazon, I have a mixed feeling about it. I mean, I think they make decisions. They make them sometimes too swift. They make them without thinking through. I think that... So they love the Amazon as resellers because resellers do something that's really great for Prime members, which is they sell below Matt, right? Yeah. Resellers will commonly break and make Matt pricing. And that's awesome. So if I can buy a North Face fleece, even though, you know, I'm making a profit off it because I bought it at TJ Maxx or TK Maxx if you're in the UK. Um, but, uh, you know, from from the standpoint of it's the best price on the internet and it's below map, you know, and this is why the resellers hate, this is this is why they hate you at at the different, the brands hate you because, because it's on Amazon, it's being advertised, right? It's being advertised on a website, right? Whereas like TJ Maxx does not advertise the prices, right? Like when you go into the store, you only know the prices once you walk into the store, but they're not being like broadcasted, right? You can't really see it so well. So it's like, plus those stores are multi-billion dollar companies. So there's not a whole lot they can do to bully those guys, but they can bully the individual sellers. So using Vero sounds like the latest and greatest. I'd love to look into it more. I have to talk to my team and find out what we can do about it if it's a real problem, but they definitely yeah, should not be using Vero. For- something that happens occasionally. And it's normally to do with the the images. Yeah, yeah, so that's the fun. trick. It's just make sure that you're using, you know, take your own pictures, and that's the that should help. Okay, that's good. Um, right. So, claiming that if you got um, if Amazon refunds a customer, um, uh-huh. and uh, they, you know, they because they, they, if you're like doing self fulfilled prime or something like that, then you sign a thing which says they have the right to do whatever they like. And my experience is, you know, have something like a parcel had been delivered. The customer says that it didn't get delivered. Um, and Amazon just give them all their money back, even though it was sent by an Amazon service, and yeah, and then you have to do a safety claim. I mean, is there anything you can do about that as a seller? I mean, look, if it, if it's an issue, if it's a problem, I mean, right now, like we're having an issue with like, people getting their you know, Amazon Amazon saying like, left and right that they're not getting the packages received by Amazon, right? Like they're they're being under, you know, they're submitting thirty units and zero or getting credit for none. Um, in this case, you've got customers abusing. Again, I've using the system saying, I mean, no, I mean, you report it to Amazon. Um, and if it's substantial enough and it's worth your time, then you keep fighting it. You know, you keep pushing the envelope. You keep, I mean, pushing the agenda that this has happened, right? Um, keep opening that case. Keep saying, you know, the customer is wrong. You know, whatever evidence you can show, um, the more ridiculous, the better the case, right? I don't recommend this. So you do that for, for a small thing. But, you know, if it happens, substan- you know, either a lot, or it's a substantial item and it's causing you substantial losses, absolutely, you should fight it. Just keep fighting it. I mean, keep fighting your corner at all times. Yeah, just just be persistent. Go go above. Send an email to Jeff at Amazon. Send a tweet to the Twitter team, right? Uh, talk to your MPs or politicians. I mean, seriously, these are the things that work, right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to get out out from out under the the, the AI bots and and sort of low-wage workers that just kind of get paid to, to move your case along for the next... Uh, you know, to the back of the queue, from the front of the queue to the back of the queue and get the people who can really make a decision. And, and you know, if, if you feel, if you feel like justified, that you were really wrong in something, I think you, I think you can find relief. I absolutely do think you can find, find, find what you're looking for in that scenario. 
But yeah, would I do it if I'm losing 10 bucks in the matter and it's once in a blue moon? No, I don't think it'd be worth your time or anyone's time. But if it's real, you know, if it's happening a lot and it's, you know, it feels like abuse um, or you have really substantial evidence and you want to make a point, um, absolutely go for it. Okay. So look, I know it's something um, you're, you know, involved with Amazon antitrust. What, what is the future of that? Do you see, what do you think that, what, what kind of things are going to happen to Amazon in the next few years? Yeah, so so I have this nonprofit called the Online Merchant Skill on the merchants online merchant skill.org. And what we do through that organization is we try to get Amazon sellers to work together and unify. And I would strongly suggest everyone just Google it, read about what we do, our court cases that we fought. Um, but one of the things we did was we were the most cited resource in the antitrust report on Amazon's mistreatment of Amazon sellers. So during the whole tech inquiry um, throughout 2019, 2020, um, we were submitting reports to the antitrust subcommittee in Congress, basically telling them, hey, these are real experiences that Amazon sellers have experienced. Um, you can read our, our submissions on the antitrust website. You can read the report on the antitrust subcommittee website for the US government, it's the public. Um, and what we're trying to do is, yeah, we're trying to get the government to, one, to sort of recognize the Amazon seller as a sort of as, as you know, these are their constituents, right? We're the voters, right? Amazon is one powerful company. The Amazon sellers in the United States are, you know, a million plus registered voters, right? So we believe we should have a voice and we're trying to get them to acknowledge that, yeah, Amazon makes a lot of mistakes and they do a lot of things wrong. Now, does that mean they should break up Amazon? I don't know. There, there was legislation that was proposed. I thought the legislation was very weak. I didn't think it was very good. So we did not necessarily support the legislation. What we tried to do and what I still would like to do we try to get more Amazon sellers to participate in the organization so that we could create what's called a seller bill of rights so that we could get some legislation passed that would basically like, instead of having us go through this guessing game of like, what do you do in this situation? Like we actually can actually have a codified federal bill of rights that when these things happen to Amazon sellers, they have certain rights, right? That, that, that way they don't have to lose sleep at night that this may happen to them or that may happen to them. And that's what we really wanted to see. Um, what the what the antitrust sub subcommittee proposed as far as legislation, what ultimately got proposed, in my opinion, was not sufficient. It was broken legislation. It would have led to nothing more than a decade's worth of litigation and probably very little outcome out of it. Uh, it just wasn't good. It wasn't. It did. It didn't. It didn't get to the root of the problem, and it just gave Amazon a big, big exit. Like there was a big loophole Amazon could use to get out of it. So we didn't like the legislation that they were proposing. So, um, but so. In this environment, though, Amazon is still very fearful of legislation. They're very feel fearful of Congress. So that's why I'm saying it's a great time to leverage your members of Congress if you need to, to get help. You know, if you cannot get what you want, if you have been unjust, you know, if you, you're subject to some real abuse or unjust treatment, now is a great time to talk to your members of Congress and have them ask them to send your, write a letter and say, can you please send this to Amazon? I want to know why this is happening. Can you please make an inquiry for me? Because I can't get through. I'm talking to an AI bot. I want to blow my brains out. This is crazy. Right? Okay. It's, it's driving me up the wall. Talk to them. Um, it's a perfect environment to do that. So, um, but what I would really like to do, what I would really, really like to do is I would like to raise, I don't know, maybe 10, 20, probably, nah, probably $30,000 a month. That's probably what we need. $30,000 a month and hire a lobbying firm and just have our voice being you know, on the ground floor in Congress in Washington, D.C., have our own seller lobbying firm that we engage representing solely our interests and our interests only out there speaking to members of Congress so that we can push for our agendas. Because we're we're, we're powerful enough that to raise $30,000 a month among millions of sellers throughout worldwide, it should not be hard. But yet it's it's been the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I can't, we can't, we haven't done it yet. So we're always looking for leaders and gatherers and folks who can really be social and influential to get sellers to work together, raise the money so that we can do some real um, legislative change in Congress to help protect the e-commerce and Amazon seller, right? I mean, it, it, there's so many issues out there that Congress needs to address regarding selling online, including taxes still to this day, still a mess. Um, and uh, no, nothing's being done because we just can't seem to figure out a small businesses that when we work together, we are the most powerful lobbying force in the world. Like we, we will be so strong, much stronger than Amazon. So hopefully one day it'll click and resonate with certain people and we'll get the type of leadership that we need who can really help us voice that message and, and get us all working together 
uh, on such a such a goal. That's my my hope because to me it's just important. And it's it's I do this as a volunteer thing. It's just fun for me. Um, it's interesting. It's it's the future of 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 the law. Um, and it's cool to be on the cutting edge. So I'm happy to do it as a, as a, just a pro bono kind of thing that I do, um, with my time. I think it's a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Cause that's, I think that sounds great. Cause I think as, as I, mean, I know as a, as a small business myself, you just get beaten up by everyone and it'd be great. And I, I feel that these big tech companies do just take the piss as we say in the UK. Um, no, they take the piss. Yes. It would be great. It yeah. would be great to have, um, you know, just, it, it all feels a bit one-sided at the moment. So okay. anyway, I've got a question. So what is the M&A? I know you do a lot of M&A stuff. What's the M&A market like at the moment? Because, you know, there's a whole lot of activity on Amazon with these Amazon aggregators. What's going on? What are you seeing? Okay, so Amazon aggregators, an interesting part of our practice. We did about $200 million in Amazon M&A deals as lawyer. So we're not we're not the broker. We're not trying. We're not trying to broker a deal. We're just simply a lawyer and we're predominantly a lawyer for the seller. We, we took a very, very early on in the aggregator bubble in 2020. We took a, a uh, so, so in 2020, we've been working on these deals probably 20, 2019 with uh, um, some of the early aggregators, 28, I don't say as far back as 2018, but um, we've been working on it for a long time. And we, we in 2020, we took a position where we're going to stop representing any aggregators, any buyers. We're, you know, we're very much a seller advocacy law firm. We didn't like the idea of being strong arming small sellers. We just thought that was that would not be a good look for us. Once we realized how common this was, we'll still represent buyers in a one on one deal. Like it was just you know Joe buyer versus Joe seller. That's fine, but we will not represent you know big agra, big agra, not agriculture, <laughs> but big agra, big aggregator. That's good. I love that. Uh, yeah, we will not do that. We just don't think it's appropriate for what for for who we are and how we identify as a as a law firm. Um, so anyway, so what we saw last year is we saw a real big bubble. We saw, uh, you know, if you, if you had the 23rd best avocado peeler on Amazon, you were getting top multiple for your product, even though it was just like, you know, you just started selling the thing a year ago and you pulled it off Alibaba, you know, but you know, it was, it was a crazy time. So we saw multiples go from, you know, in the twos, you know, in terms of like closing cash. Um, which is what the only thing I really care about when I deal a deal with my clients the closing cash, like all these extra earnouts and, and, and gravy items, they're gravy. So I don't like to, you know, they can be all over the place and there can be so many strings attached to them. It's just, it's better not to actually take them into consideration as value and just treat them as gravy because they oftentimes don't work out. Um, and if you're relying on that as a source of, of part of your deal, then you shouldn't do the deal. Like if, if you need that earnout to work out for you, in order to feel like you're getting a good deal, then it's not the right deal. That's what I always tell our clients. It's just, it's just, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, and so little recourse you have, especially since suing somebody in a deal like that can be cost, can cost more than the, than the earn out is worth in the first place. So just, just, just already a negative value type claim where the juice ain't worth the squeeze, as they say. So that's your starting point. So always focus on closing cash. So we would see closing cash for some companies like in the twos, you know, 2.5, 2.7, you know, going into 2020. In 2020, we saw kind of what I would say is if you're under a million dollars in earnings, profit, SDE, which is uh, discretionary earnings, however you want to calculate, whatever that number was, that was the basis for which the multiple would be applied. If you under a million, typically you would get three to three and a half at most going into 2021 uh, in terms of closing cash and then maybe another one to one and a half in terms of those sort of, you know, uh, uh, earn out possibilities, whatever they may be. But what we saw kind of going into the second half of 2022, sorry, of 2021, that was 2020, is we saw a shift and we started to see, you know, first we saw just a number of deals we were doing going up tremendously. But then we were starting to see the multiples cracking, like just breaking new records. So suddenly brands doing under a million in profit were getting like five, six X multiples, which was crazy. So, um, you could tell that there was a real bubble happening. Like, you know, it just was, it was so easy. You could literally just email, you know, hello to the list of a hundred aggregators on the internet and you'd have a hundred people wanting to buy your business. It was just, it was that ridiculous how much, how strong the market was. There were new aggregators popping up every night. I call them fly by night aggregators. Um, they would just show up They're like, Oh, have you ever heard of like ABC L elemental upside down brands? I'm like, no, is that a thing? I'm like, like Oh yeah. They're, you know, they just formed last night. It was started by a seller, and uh, you know they got funding from their dad. It was just it was just crazy. Everybody was was getting funding and doing this stuff. So yeah, it bubbled. 
it bubbled like crazy. Um, in 2021, we did, like I said, we did over $200 million in deals last year. I would say we did over a hundred million of those deals, like from October to December of last. So that fourth quarter was insane. Fourth quarter was the craziest quarter of my life as a lawyer. I've never worked more in my life. I, I almost died. Like it was ridiculous how much we were working. We were working Christmas, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve. It was just nonstop. <clears throat> then 2022, you got rising interest rates. You've got rising PPC costs. You've got all sorts of things happening. All of a sudden, like everyone's not doing very well, right? And so we had a nice, healthy inflow of LOI, letters of intent, new deals coming. But then suddenly they just weren't closing. So aggregators started shutting the doors, declaring to the world that they're done buying for now. So, so what we saw was basically what happened is in 2021, a lot of these aggregators got what's called aggregator indigestion. So they were acquiring too many brands and they didn't know how to manage them. They weren't as good at it as they pretended that as they claimed they were, right? So they all said they were so good at it. They actually weren't. They knew nothing. You know, some of it was just like, oh, we'll just bump up PPC. That was literally the 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 uh, the, the argument. So at the end of the day, uh, what ended up happening was like we've just seen a substantial downturn in the number of deals we're doing. Multiples have come down. The offers we're seeing are like in the three, you know, under three. If you're under, you know, half a million, it's like under three. It's it's it's, it's like really small deals. Um, even above a million, we're seeing like three to four multiples. We're just not seeing what we saw last year. So multiples have come down a lot. Deal complexity and sophistication has come up a ton. So this is where now it's like, okay, the deal is a couple million bucks. We're going to see like the same law firms I used to work with at like Microsoft show up. And now it's going to take us like, and instead of closing in like 45 days, it can take like four or five months to close because the lawyers, it's the back and forth. It's just nonstop. And it's, it just takes forever. So it's a very different environment today than it was last year. Last year was, I've never seen anything like it, but we did call a bubble. We did tell our clients, like we posted on Facebook last year, like this feels like a bubble, but nothing wrong with selling in a bubble, right? Like not not for you, like as a seller, great time to sell. Even if your earnout doesn't work out, you got six X when today you'd get three. So mm. in some ways, you know, you made a good, you know, if you were eager to get out, what I will say this is this, and this is what was always sad about people who sold it. You know, a lot of times, a lot of our clients overwhelmingly the overwhelming you know i always call up my clients afterwards and do a little bit of a just a just a check in and say hey congratulations what are you going to buy you're going to buy a trophy you get yourself a little token to remember this you know what are you going to do and just have a little chat and and the story that i always hear most is that m the number one reason why they sell is because they want to take their chips off the table in other words they're just they they they've been living in fear of amazon shutting them down at any given moment that just this idea of being able to just get away from it and put it on somebody else's plate and just take the money and run was just, it was just like, you know, it, it was like Nirvana for them to just finally be rid of it. You know, like, Hey, I've done this done and taken it this far at any given moment. I feel like Amazon could just pull the plug on me. I might as well just take my chips off the table and be done. And they are glad they did, you know, but it's, you know, that's, not good for Amazon. Right. When we talk about like how Amazon sellers feel, that's, that's not, what you want, right? You don't want your your businesses that are running on your platform to feel that way. So I don't know if anyone it shows there was a lot. Does anyone enjoy selling yeah. Amazon? I don't know if they do. No, no. But it's a it's a it's a it's an obvious necessity. They are the railroad, as we told Congress. They are the railroad of e-commerce. We can't we can't do without them. So we're stuck with them, and and that's the problem. So I always thought it was sad because um, I always say that eBay is a place where people enjoy selling. But it just no. I like I typically like eBay. Yes, I personally when I sell, I still sell on the side, like not as much as I used to. But I, I go straight to eBay. I like eBay. But for me, yeah. it's occasional selling. But I don't think volume is hard on eBay. I think it's hard. I don't know. I don't know what it is about eBay. But like you know, I, I can tell you with consistency, like most of our clients are multi-channel. They're Walmart, Amazon, eBay, Shopify. But Amazon just with with the ability to add FBA. The logistics of that, I mean, they're just 90% Amazon. Like it's just like they it's just they just can't get the volume out of those other marketplaces as they can with Amazon. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. You know? I've got look, I've got it's been very interesting talking to you. I've got one last question, which I haven't warned you about. Sure. I'm not going to warn everyone about this. What do you do when you're not thinking about e-commerce law? What are you geeky about? Oh, that's a good question. Any good, um, any good books recently? Seen any good films? Got anywhere interesting? Uh, I do love to travel. So I spent two months this summer in Poland. My wife's Polish. 
we have a house by the seashore. So I had uh, spent, I have a great team who covered me and let me, so I played a lot of golf. Uh, I'm a flight sim, I'm a gamer geek. I used to work for Microsoft. I have an Xbox, I'm not on PS. I do like to game when I have free time. I don't usually have free time, but when I do, it's always fun to just like grab a Joy-Con and just play a little bit. Um, I love flight simulators. I love airplanes. Uh, I don't know. I'm just a weird guy. It's like weird stuff. Um, and I like to just, uh, I don't know. I just like to relax. I mean, reading, I'll be honest with you. I hate reading books. Like I, I, I'm one of those people, like it's because I read for a living. Like I read all day, every day. Like I read these cases. I read, you know, it's just like, to me, reading feels so like I do, I'll listen to books more than I like to read the books, but it's just, it's just like, I don't, it doesn't relax me. You know what I mean? But I do, there are good books, obviously that I like, but you know, there's certain books that, you know, the kind of books that kind of, you know, like Outliers was like a life changing book for me when I was younger, right? By Malcolm Gladwell. Just That's reading it. It's just, it was, it was an awesome book. You know, Richard Branson's first uh, book I read when I was 17 years old, right? That was awesome, right? Or 18 years old, whenever it came, it came out in 98, so probably 18. So, um, you know, I love that story. I love the book. I love the story of, you know, the, you know, the original story of the high school dropout who, who just built this, you know, empire. And yeah, you know, he, he did some hustling. His on dad, his way his dad was pretty top. rich. He, he went to his first job interview in like a Rolls Royce. So is that true? <laughs> yeah. He's not nearly as, he's not nearly as, um, he's pretty well no. connected. No, I just, yeah, well, I think you have to be the starting airline. Like, there's always that element. There's always something missing. But what I liked the story was, like, you know, that he was kind of like, he was doing tax tax evasion. Like, his first yeah, did, you know, version records, yeah, rec rec version records was built on tax evasion, you know, and just got caught, you know, and he learned his lesson. And just fascinating story, you know, meeting, you know, tubular bells and the whole story there. But, I, and again, I was 18. So, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. But I did, I, I enjoyed that book. Um, I'm trying to think of the books I've read recently, but I just, I just don't, um, and I don't, I don't read as much as I should, but I do try to listen to to books, you know, um, as much as I can, you know, before bed, I try to like, just put on an audio book and listen, but it's, it's weird how like, I, I just, I read so much during the day. I read so much case law and so much crap. It's just like, I just, it's like, it's like, it's just like, I, it's turned me off to the, to the, the idea of reading for pleasure. It's just like a oh, hard, no. I, read, I read a lot, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It, it's just like I read too much. I'm like, I've read enough. I'm like, I'm done. Uh, just I tell me what, you know what I get. I, when I'm reading a contract or something, I, I can get to about through the first paragraph or something, and it just does my head in. So I can see what you mean. Yeah. It's not just, yeah. it's not like for you, you're, it's not just like reading a book for you. It's like reading the densest thing, which is the hardest to understand. Ah, it's very dry. Yeah. And then a purchase agreement contract and MA contract is the worst. But I, I, you know, those I enjoy. It's just, it's, I've always been a fine print. Like, you know, I'll tell you my life story is like, okay, so I was an Amazon seller before there was a thing, right? I was flipping stuff in the early 2000s before FBI. Never thought you could make money or a living, right? I'm like, I'm like paying for law school selling on Amazon, but I'm not like, this is going to replace my income. I could make my whole life off of this, right? I, so I, I just kind of gave up on it and I would do it as a side hassle. And then I find out like, 12, 15 years later that, oh, no, I, if I had just stuck with it, I probably would have been immensely rich and and would have been early to the party. And, and so I, I always have this story of being early to the party, but a lot of it is fine print. So like I was a really big like mile hacker when I was in the, in the 90s. Like I had already oh, figured okay. out these credit cards, you know, like signing up for the credit cards and getting those bonus miles and oh, yeah. playing different games and churning, churning because I like to travel and I wanted, I didn't have any money. I was a student, right? Like it was in college. So like I was like I like to mile hack like I like to read the fine print I was always attracted to fine print and finding little loopholes and and ways to kind of game the system it was always kind of fun but you, there was no such thing as a blog then so I didn't know you could write blogs about it and make millions you know just being the blogger of it like like you got the points guy now so I've always kind of been too early to a lot of parties but um, no I just I I don't know man I like I love uh, I've always had a secret passion of want to be wanting to be a pilot so I really do like. Um, when I'm not hanging out with my family, we're not doing like, you know, stuff you do as a family. Like uh, I've always liked the flight simulators. I like, like to just kind of go to different places and see stuff. And I like to travel and I like to, I don't know, just go places. I, I don't know. I don't really have, a, I don't really have a sound hobby. I don't really have a no, you mean, yeah. Look, for someone who doesn't say you, you've answered, that's possibly the longest answer to that question that anyone's given. So I don't know. It's a weird, it's, got, nobody's got, ever asked me the question. And it's like, and then I think now I'm thinking of weird. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to defend them. No, I think it's good. Look, it's, it's, it's supposed to, it's supposed to be a, like a question to, I don't know. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a trick question, but it's supposed to slightly stretch you. Um, so Paul, look, it's been great chatting to you. And uh, what, what was the name of your site again? It was, um, 
your so, seller advocacy group? So the seller advocacy group is onlinemerchantskill.org and anyone who wants to work with us in our suspension program, it's sellerbasics.com. And my law, my email is paulecom.law, which is our law firm, ecom.law, Raffles and Law. And you know, I'd love to hear from you and, and meet anyone out there. We're always looking to meet good folks. But um, yeah, that's what we got. Great. Okay. Love to speak to you and good luck for the future. Uh, fingers crossed, man. And let us know if we can be of any help. Like, please reach out to me. Let me know. Okay. Let my team take a look at it because, you know, sometimes they see things that even I miss. So they're very good. So Excellent. I welcome you to that's, give that's me a try. Good. So, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.